Hey guys, Nate Johnson here, and we're gonna get in depth on the Negative Lab Pro settings and setup. And I'm gonna walk you through all the different settings. I'm gonna show you um, how to start adjusting your negatives, how to get the right conversions, how to uh, adjust it after the conversion. And we're gonna go really deep on uh, all the possibilities of Negative Lab. So just to get started, I'm gonna assume that uh, you already have some either DSLR scans or uh, maybe you have some scans from your flatbed scanner. But the first thing we're, we're gonna wanna do once you've loaded those scans is we're always gonna want to white balance um, and we're gonna white balance off of the film mask. So hopefully when you were either DSLR scanning or using your flatbed scanner, um, you've left a little bit of room here so that you can sample a neutral target. So we'll go ahead and do that. And I always, after I do that, I always just kind of check and make sure that this looks right. If I see the temperature slammed all the way up here, you know, all the way down to 2000, right at the max, um, I usually try to back off it just a little bit because uh, you can start to see a little bit of degradation in the colors if you push the profile too hard. Um, so I usually don't go a little bit more than, you know, somewhere around 2300, 2400. But in this case, we're within that range. So that's looking good. And then the next thing we always need to do is crop this. And I'll just make a make a quick virtual copy right here so I can demo the differences for you. I'm gonna hit Command Apostrophe. And this is one of the great things of working in a non-destructive workflow is I can have multiple copies that I'm working on just to, just to demonstrate. Okay, so in this example, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to crop it. And I'm gonna crop it so that uh, so that just the image itself is showing. So I don't want any of the border, I don't want any of the film mask, I don't want any of that stuff. I just want the actual image itself, okay? And in this version, I'll just keep it, I'll just keep it uh, completely uncropped. So watch what happens here. I'm gonna pull up Negative Lab, and um, I'll go ahead and hit Convert. And the problem with this is that it thinks that as it's as it's rendering and computing this, it actually thinks that uh, you know this is part of the image data itself, and uh, it's not, and so it really throws off the interpretation of uh, the negative. Whereas if I just have the film itself and I hit convert, it has a much uh, much truer look at how it what it needs to do to to change it. Okay, so that looks better. Now let me show you a big mistake I see people making. Um, a lot of people send me uh, send me their photos and ask me, you know, what what's going on with it. And a big mistake I see is that a lot of people get really close to cropping it right and uh, leave just a tiny bit of the film mask in, and that throws it off. So you may think that you know you you may think that this is cropped enough, but the fact that it has even just that little bit of film mask over there, um, that will be enough to throw it off. So I'll just unconvert this and then I'll reconvert it. And just to show you the difference. Okay, so you see how this looks all, it looks all blown out and it, it just doesn't look right. The colors are off um, compared to this. So the, it, it actually makes a, a really big difference, even just leaving a little bit of this mask in. So probably the biggest mistake I see people making and saying, hey, this, this isn't working the way it's supposed to, it's because they've left a little bit of the film mask in. And by the way, I should mention for Mac users, you can pull up Negative Lab Pro anytime by hitting Control N. And uh, you can also go to File, Plugin Extras, and find Negative Lab Pro there. And if you're a Windows user, for now, that's what you're gonna have to do is go to the plugin extras and hit negative, negative Lab Pro to bring it up. Okay, so let's go back into those settings and let me just walk you through the color model and what that does. With Negative Lab Pro, you can also do batch processing, which can be really useful and time-saving. You just have to make sure that you've gone in with each of the images and that you've already done the steps I just showed you that you uh, do before conversion, that you've gone in and white balanced off of the film mask, and then you have cropped. And uh, if you've uh, if if you've used the same process and the same film type, um, you can 
you know, select them here and then go to sync settings and just sync the crop and sync the, the white balance. And that can speed up this step a little bit. Um, but you want to make sure that this is done before conversion. Otherwise, you'll get uh, you'll, you'll get some weird results. So we've already done that. So let's go ahead and um, in the library module, we can select them all. We'll hit Control N, and we'll hit Convert 13 negatives. And so the cool thing about this is that Negative Lab Pro is actually going in and making a conversion for each of these images independently, which is really important because um, some of these images are denser than others. So some of these images, more light has come into contact with the film. The film um, has uh, has added density to it as more light has added up on it. And so it needs, um, it, it needs different settings. Um, and not only that, but the scene itself uh, will need different settings to white balance it depending upon whether it was cloudy or um, overcast or a bright and sunny day. And so going in and being able to analyze each of these images independently is really one of the secrets to how this works so well. Okay, so it's we've done this conversion and um, you may want to uh, think about if there's specific uh, tone profiles that you like across all of them or tones. And we'll talk about what all these do in just a minute, but. At some point, you'll want to sync settings. So let me just show you really fast how that's done. Let's say I come in here and change this to all hard. As I do that, you can see that it's only it's only impacted this image right here. So watch this image as I change the color balance right here. Uh, you can see that only that image is changing and the rest aren't. And the reason for that is I don't I don't want uh, if you have multiple selected. Um, you may not necessarily want all of them to follow the changes you make in the first one. So by default, it's only impacting the initial one that you selected. But when you have multiple selected, there's this sync settings button that appears. So I'll just hit sync settings. And now across all the images, these settings will be carried over. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, convert this using the frontier color model. And what this does is it's basically changing some things in the color matrix and some of the internal settings and um, emulating the colors that you would expect to get from a Fuji frontier scanner. So you're going to see, um, you're going to see warmer skin tones uh, that are a little bit more yellow. Um, you're going to see uh, warmer greens with maybe a little bit better set, uh, a little bit separation between the greens and the yellows. And it's a really nice, pleasing look. I'd say this is probably one of the most popular, um, one of the most popular looks that are associated with film. Just to compare this, I'll make a virtual copy hitting command apostrophe, call up negative lab, uh, unconvert this copy and change the color, color model to Naritsu and go ahead and apply that. Whoops, we need to convert it. So we'll go ahead and convert that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so this this makes very subtle changes, um, but uh, if if we look up close and compare the two of these, um, you can actually see. So this is this is the Naritsu on the left, and uh, this is the Frontier on the right. So you see how these skin tones are a little bit more pink, and these are a little bit more yellow. And I'll also point out that. Um, that the greens here are a little bit blue, are a little bit fresher, a little bit bluer in the Naritsu, and over in the frontier, um, they're a little bit warmer, and there's better separation between the greens and the yellows. So it's not, if you're looking for a huge, huge difference, you're probably not going to see it. Um, and there are a lot of other factors uh, within the settings that will make a bigger difference. So if you're unsure, I would say probably stick with the frontier. Uh, unless there's a reason that you really want to go for the Naritsu look. Now, one more thing I'll just do is I will um, I'll compare this with what it would look like if we didn't have a color model. So if we were to unconvert this and go to none, uh, this is essentially all, all, the, all the defaults in, in Lightroom. Um, so I'll go ahead and hit convert. So this is just using Adobe Standard as the base. And you'll see that uh, there's some major problems with the color, with the skin tones. 
um, you'll see that it's darker because it wasn't done. It, the conversion wasn't happening in a linear space. There's a lot of problems with it, especially compared to the great results that we got here using the Frontier. So if you're doing a comparison versus what you would get normally in Lightroom, um, put put the color model on none and you put the tone profile on linear. We'll get to the tone prof profiles here in a little bit. And um, this is what it would look like if you didn't change anything and just came in and tried to manually adjust the tone curve um, without making any without making any major changes. All right, so let's talk about pre-saturation. The way that Lightroom works, you have these tone curves and uh, the tone curves, as you're applying contrast, it's also changing the saturation levels. Um, there's no kind of pure luminosity tone curve inside of Lightroom, but we can pretend to have one by uh, basically uh, adjusting the saturation to offset the changes from the tone curve. So if I come in here and change the pre-saturation to high, this is essentially not making any adjustments for the effect of the tone curve. So I'll hit convert negative just to show you what that looks like. And in this setting, you're going to have the um, the best color separation and the truest colors of any of the settings because it's not actually it's not actually changing any of the saturation settings. If we come here and we look at um, we look at the saturation, it's at zero. If we come and look in the HSL panel, all the saturation settings are at zero as well. Um, but you may find that in a lot of situations, especially if we uh, if we want the tone profile to be uh, a little bit more intense, you may find that the colors uh, start to um, start to clip, start to break down, start to look unnatural, and you start to get kind of these um, th these spikes in colors and um, th these kind of atomic <laughs> colors that are just explosive. So uh, we can come back in here and unconvert, and um, from a lot of testing and and looking at what actual uh, lab scanners would produce. I've set this default pre-saturation here, and this will get us uh, a more neutral starting point for saturation. And you can see, if you come and look at the settings, it's actually gone in and made very specific changes to the saturation levels in the HSL panel, and it's doing that. Um, it's doing that to compensate for the extra contrast that we're putting in the tone curve. Now that still feels a little bit over saturated so I can come in here and make it even lower. And a trick that you'll find is that the more amount of uh, uh, the more amount of contrast that you're putting into it, the greater you're going to want to lower the pre-saturation. All right, so let's talk about auto color. So after I, uh, after I convert a negative, the first thing I always check is the auto color. And the auto color is, uh, it basically has analyzed the scene and it's looking at the color balance in between the color channels. So as I hit auto color, it attempts to uh, basically average out the colors in the scene. And you see here it works really well. The starting scene has a little bit of a blue cast to it. And as I use the auto color, that actually looks fantastic. Um, in some cases, you may find that, you, that the auto color overcorrects. And if that's the case, you can just select in here and mouse down. And in 10% increments, it will blend the effect of the auto color. You can even go minus if you want to do the opposite. Or you can hit shift plus up or shift plus down to increment in 50% increments. But I always find it's good to, the first thing I do is I check and say, okay, does auto color make it better or worse? And is it too strong or is it not strong enough? And then I can come in and adjust it. The uh, second auto control is auto density. Now auto density is kind of like auto levels inside of Photoshop. It's trying to average out the brightness of the scene. So I'll just hit auto density here. And it's basically looked at the scene and said, okay, there's a lot of, um, you know, if I look at the tone curve, there's, or if I look at the histogram, there's a, a lot of tones kind of bunched up here. Um, it's not quite balanced. If I hit auto density, it will try to kind of move everything into the middle. So if this were a darker scene, it would try to push it up. Since it's a brighter scene, it tries to pull it down a little bit. Uh, this can be useful too, just to kind of check real fast and see if it makes it better or worse and um, by how much so I can come in and blend 
this as well. And a lot of times you may find just as a combination of auto color and auto density that this is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And so I, I would encourage you to, uh, to check this out and, and, and see if that improves it. Now I will say, um, uh, so if, if you click on these and you don't see anything happening, um, it's possible that it thinks that the scene is already balanced. Um, it, it may also be possible that you need to change some settings in Lightroom. If I were to do this and, well here, I'll just show you. In Lightroom, if you go to, um, if you go to preferences and then to performance, if you're using a graphics processor, this can actually cause a lot of problems in Lightroom. Uh, I, I have mine sw switched off all the time anyway, but um, I know uh, some of you may not because it's I think it's checked by default. So if I do this and uh, I have my graphics processor enabled and I come in here and I click this and nothing happens and you're like, oh, okay, well that's weird. But if I click it again, it kind of, it kind of gets like all jumbled up and gets mixed up. And if I look at the, the preview, I can actually see that the preview is changing correctly, even though this isn't. If you run into a situation like that, where things aren't responding uh, the way they should, and things kind of get thrown off between the preview and the main window, just come in and go to Lightroom, Preferences, Performance, and uncheck this, and that should make everything sync perfectly again. So a little tip if, if you find that that isn't working. Okay, well let's talk about the tone profiles. Um, if if you're used to doing this inversion by hand or using third-party software, the chances are the starting point that you're used to is a linear tone profile. Um, so if I come over here and let me just turn turn this off, reset this, and come in here. So linear profile, if you look at the tone curve, you see that it's basically set, whoops, what am I doing here? It's basically set the um, the white point and the black point, and then just a straight line in between. That's done that for each of the color channels. I have a little bit of in adjustment in here, um, which I can turn off from the auto color. So if I do that, that'll be a little bit a little bit straighter. Um, so yeah, so that so basically, if you're used to using uh, Color Perfect or uh, using an Adobe inversion as a starting point, um, you're used to uh, starting with just a linear tone profile. And of course, if you wanted to, you could always start with this and then just adjust it however you wanted in the setting. So I can come in here and increase, you know, increase the, the brights, take down the darks to add some contrast, push up the blacks, pull down the whites. I can basically recreate any of the tone profiles from scratch if I want to inside of here. Or as a better starting point, um, I've developed uh, these different tone profiles that will get you closer, hopefully out of the gates and require uh, not, as, not, not as much editing inside of the tones. And so if you look at standard, um, the standard profile is uh, an attempt to add a little bit of contrast. Um, it pushes up the black point a little bit, pulls down the white point a little bit to give a little bit of, of breathing room. And uh, this is something that's uh, that's more typical of um, th the result that you would expect to get directly out of uh, a pro lab or a pro lab scanner. Uh, I can do all hard, which is gonna be heavier contrast in both the shadows and the highlights. I can do all soft, which is going to be softer. It's, it's a little bit closer to, um, to linear but uh, it actually does have a little bit of contrast and, and roll off in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the blacks and whites. I do highlights hard, highlights soft, shadows hard, shadows soft. Um, if, if you ever wonder what each of these are, are doing and it doesn't make sense just from the name, you can hover over tone profile and it'll give you, it'll give you a description of uh, what these settings are and what they're doing. I usually find I like to start with uh, either standard, all hard, or linear. And uh, maybe I'll show you real fast a, a good situation for starting off on linear. If you find that um, you're working with a scene that um, 
uh, that that feels like just all, out of the starting gate, it has way too much contrast in it, um, and you're losing a lot of details that you want, then um, then you can come in here. So this is already uh, this is already uh, you're, it feels like it's maybe losing some detail here, and this is exactly what you would expect to get out of a scanner uh, from a lab, actually. But uh, if you wanted to get something that that felt uh, like it had a little bit more uh, a little bit more breathing room in it, a little bit more uh, detail, I would just come in here and go to linear. And now I'm getting uh, smoother transitions. Um, I'm, I'm not losing as much detail in the shadow. It's a very very neutral starting point that I can then start making further adjustments to. So uh, if, if you find that uh, you know you, you feel like you're not liking what you're getting with the standard profile conversion, definitely come in and, and check out Linear and see if you like what you can get um, coming in here and, and, and adjusting it um, as opposed to using the profile. Negative Lab Pro also comes with some sharpening models and I'll show you what that looks like here. The first well, by default, it, uh, it it defaults to none, so it's not changing the sharpening settings. But I can come in here and set this to lab. And uh, this is going to be closer to what you would get from a professional lab. It's going to be smoothing out the skin tones a little bit, make it look softer, but still providing some nice sharpening on the edges especially. Uh, it's also using a little bit of noise reduction, so you won't see, uh, it won't be sharpening the grain as prominently. So uh, this is just a, especially if you're working with, um, uh, if you're working on portraits, the lab sharpening is awesome. If you're working with something where you want the sharpening to really come through something that's maybe a little bit grittier, then the, uh, then the scanner sharpening is great. And the scanner sharpening is going to, rem is going to give you this, this really gritty, look where it, it's really exposing the the grain it's not it's not trying to to mask or hide anything it, it's giving you that kind of um uh, lomographic look that's that's really popular negative lab pro gives you a ton of control over uh, the tones in the way that you edit your image so we'll go ahead and, and um, i'll just walk you through this should be pretty self-explanatory but i'll walk you through how to start thinking about tones in your image um, one trick I'll show you, if uh, if uh, you can learn a lot by watching this histogram as you uh, update the tones, you can also learn a lot by turning on um, the histogram clipping. So if you press uh, J, you should see um, these arrows in either end um, get highlighted a little bit, and that'll make it so that as we edit this, we'll actually be able to see if we're clipping any areas in the image. All right, so open up Naked Lab Pro and start editing the tones. So the first control here, uh, the mid-tones is basically like a, a density adjustment. So as I pull this down, the whole image will get darker. And as I pull it up, the whole image will get brighter. So if you find that uh, an image feels light and airy, and instead you want it to, to, feel, uh, to feel really dense and have a lot of texture to it, just take down these mid-tones. If you have an image that you want to feel more bright and airy, I just push these up a little bit and you can see, you can watch the histogram um, moving, uh, especially from those, uh, those, those middle peaks there as I adjust these midtones. The lights is, uh, is a control that's basically uh, affecting the upper half of the histogram and pushing or pulling down the brighter areas of your photo. So if I want, uh, if I want to uh, to have the, 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 the highlights really bright and pop, I can push these lights up. If I want to, uh, to see more detail in the brighter areas, I can just pull this down. Um, the same with the darks, I can pull down the darks to, um, to make the shadows darker, or I can push it up to make it brighter. Now, if I want to simply add contrast to this image, all I need to do is uh, pull down the darks and push up the lights. And that's the same thing as adding contrast. The black point and the white point are just moving the entire histogram uh, from either the darkest point or the brightest point in the image. So as I move 
as I move the whites, uh, watch what happens on the histogram. As I, as I pull down the whites, you can see that the entire histogram is um, squishing down from the right side. And as I push up the whites, you can see it moving over. So with, the, with this, it's possible to, to really start to clip. So you can see since I have um, uh, cl clipping highlighted here, I can see as my image is, is clipping. Most of the time, you're not going to want to clip. Um, it, it's it, certainly there's cases where you may not care about information, and you can do that, which is fine. But the most, for the most part, it um, it'll make your image look more digital and not uh, as analog. Um, and by default, uh, these tone profiles, uh, all of them except linear, give you a little bit of space. Um, so you shouldn't be clipping out of the box with. Uh, unless you're using the linear profile, in which case you may see just a tiny bit of clipping because it's going right up to that point. Okay. Now the same is true with the blacks. I can pull this down to the point to where I start clipping the blacks, or I can push it up to add a sort of fade effect. So as you see as I do this, it's literally just moving the entire, the entire histogram over. So using a combination of uh, the tone profile and um, the more uh, refined tonal controls, uh, you can really get any kind of look that you want from uh, the, from a really faded but but super high contrast look um, to uh, something that feels like it's very uh, very linear and um, has lots of information in it. One of the most powerful parts of Negative Lab Pro is the color balancing. So you can actually color balance in Negative Lab Pro um, in the mids, the highs, and the shadows. So the mids are going to be what you would typically think of as color balancing. So as I move this slider uh, over towards red, you see the entire image becomes a little bit more red. As I move towards cyan, it becomes more cyan. And if you watch, you can actually see um, the color is changing in the histogram. You can see uh, the separation happening. You see kind of the red getting pushed up and then the red getting pulled back down. If I were to do that in the shadows, watch what happens here with just the shadow and watch what happens in the shadow of the image. As I push up the reds, you can see the reds actually changing from the shadows. And as I pull it down, you can now see the cyan going up in the shadows. Uh, the same thing is true with the highs. If you come to the highs, it'll it'll basically color balance from the white point. So I can come in and um, make the whites appear to be more red or make the whites appear to be more cyan. Um, so that's the difference between the mids, the highs, and the shadows. Uh, typically think of the mids as this is the actual uh, bulk of the color correction and uh, the highs and the shadows are more for effects. Um, it could potentially be used also to uh, color correct a very difficult negative, but for the most part, it's going to be for effects that you may associate with film. So, in terms of approach, um, I'll typically c come in and you know first I'll check auto color, and here it, it's saying that this is a pretty balanced scene. Um, so it's really just up to up to my taste, and I usually like things a little bit warmer, um, so I can warm up between blue and yellow, I'll, I'll uh, shift it a little bit towards yellow. And that's already looking way better to my taste. And then I can come in and between red and cyan, I'll add a little bit of red. So adding a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow is uh, essentially the same thing as adding orange, the way that, uh, the way that it works out. Uh, you can also check between green and magenta. And I think I like this, I think I like this pretty much zeroed out here. Now you can take this further by going into the shadows, and if I wanted to um, to kind of punch up that effect even more, I could do the same thing in the shadows. I could make the shadows more yellow and more red, and you can see it kind of makes the effect um, effect a little bit uh, feel a little bit more pervasive because it's going all the way from the midtones in through the shadows. I'll just pull down um, pull down these darks a little bit here, maybe pull down the blacks. Or what you can do is you could try to do uh, the opposite in the shadows. So I could make the shadows a little cooler, maybe a little bit more cyan. 
and uh, this creates balance in a, in a totally different way. Um, and you see this, uh, you see this a lot, uh, where you, you basically you're going one way with the overall color balance, but then you balance that out by going the opposite way, neither the shadows or the highs or both. And so here, this feels like a very balanced image. You've got a little bit, uh, a little bit cooler shadows, and uh, but the midtones are nice and warm. And I could even, I could even dial that up a, a bit more. So doing something like that can create a very balanced feel. Now I can also come in here, and a lot of times uh, you'll see that uh, you'll see images where it just feels like there's kind of this warm glow to it. To replicate that, you can just go to the highs and. We'll just add a little bit of yellow and see how it just kind of mellows out the overall image and makes it feel like it's got a little bit of a yellow glow. I can add a little bit of red. And so that's that's basically it. I'll come in and uh, adjust a lot to taste in here. There's not necessarily a right or wrong. A lot of it is just uh, taste and you know whether you're going for uh, this warm uh, glowing look or whether there's there's a different look that you're going for. Okay, so let's say that this was the image that we came back with and we wanted to edit it further inside of Lightroom. Now, if we hit apply, uh, you'll notice that, uh, and you probably already know this, but the, the changes that you make to the regular panels are gonna be kind of wacky. Uh, they're gonna be really sensitive and uh, they're going to work non-intuitively. So for instance, as I move the exposure up here, it's making it darker and changing the color balance to be a little bit uh, kind of blue. As I move the exposure down, it's making it brighter and warmer. Um, so there are certain things that you definitely want to stay away from editing when you're still in this uh, in this raw space. And uh, I would say most of the tonal edits would fall into that into that space. Uh, you may also be tempted to come in and edit the tone curve by hand, which you can do. But just be aware that if you do, when you open back up Negative Lab, uh, the moment that you make a change it'll actually uh, reset that because it's it's building this from scratch each time. One change though that uh, that can be actually really useful is coming down to the HSL panel, selecting saturation, and then using the selector tool to, um, to drag in the photo. So I may come in and find, okay, I like the colors in this in general, but I feel like this pink is way too much. So I can just come in here select this and pull down and take down just the pink. And this actually works uh, pretty well. You may, you may not want to go, you know, overboard because you can start to get some wacky effects. But if you're doing it, you know, just a just a little bit, sometimes that's all you need to um, to fine tune it exactly the way that you want. Let me come in and say, okay, this yellow, um, I don't want to be taken down as much or I want this green to be a little bit less. You, know, you can you can within reason come in and use this to adjust the colors in your scene. Um, a lot better than say if you were just to try to do this by hand. Uh, everything is still going off of the original. So if you try to do this by hand and you say, oh, the reds are um, uh, the reds are too uh, are too saturated, I want to take it down. It's not going to work as you would expect because what it considers red is still in this original space. It's still going off of of this raw image. Um, so I do find that it is helpful if I want to fine tune stuff. Uh, this is a really simple technique for doing that. But more often than not, if I want to make changes inside of uh, inside of Lightroom that uh, that I'm not making inside a Negative Lab, the best way to do that is inside a inside a Negative Lab Pro. I'll just pull it up, and you select TIFF Copy. Now what this does is it takes uh, takes this current raw. And when we apply it, it actually just makes a positive TIFF copy that is then really easy to edit off of. Okay, so it's put the positive TIFF copy into the library. I can just hit um, hit the I key in Lightroom to see. And I'll just append positive and TIFF to the image. And so now, if I come in here and want to make a change, uh, you'll see that everything works exactly exactly as it should. Um, exposure is in the right direction. Uh, contrast works. I can use the uh, the white balance tool to come in and um, if I feel like the white balance is still off, I can come in and select a different uh, different neutral point. Um, so basically, all everything that you're used to doing inside of Lightroom 
uh, you can do off of this positive tip version. Um, I find that it's typically better to try to get as far as you can with the raw version. And the, the reason for that is because it has access to the underlying white balance and the color matrix and all these different things that you won't have anymore. But this is a, a great way to, to, to fine tune.